Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. As you can see, I obviously don't have enough computers. I've got some broken stuff, and I've got an idea for reusing a broken laptop. I'm thinking something a little bit retro and a little bit cyberpunk. So the main incentive for this project is to take my giant briefcase of doom containing a broken laptop, a tangle of cables, all my SDR stuff and filters and satellite stuff and radio experiment stuff, combine all of that into one self-contained portable unit that's not such a giant mess. One of these days maybe I'll make this into like a cyber deck or something where it's all self-contained, but right now it's just my bin of satellite related garbage. Yet another reason why I need a new computer system for my satellite and radio experiments. This old laptop has a completely dead internal battery and the power supply plug is held in there so loosely that a light breeze, a vibration, even typing too hard will pop that out. So another incentive for building this uh, satellite hacking cyber deck is that I picked up yet another one of these uh, aimable RV satellite dishes. This may or may not have been underwater at some point, may or may not work, I don't know. Uh, there's still some cool parts in it, and I only paid five dollars for this one, so even if it's busted, I'm sure I can do something with it. So first up, I actually have to boot up this old laptop with a regular VGA monitor. The USB powered monitor seems to work, but this computer is too old to understand how to output video to USB. And since the keyboard isn't quite working on this laptop either, that also means an external keyboard. We're going to see how much dumpster equipment we can pull together. So Linux is working, but it still thinks there's two monitors, so we're going to have to completely disable the onboard monitor somehow. So next we need to get that USB monitor working so that I can actually use it in a mobile configuration and run everything off the battery. Ironically enough, I just tried to give this away. I was going to get rid of it, but uh, it's too old for any of my friends to want it. So, all right, we're trying to install some sketchy 2015 drivers for that USB monitor. So everything has now successfully jumped over to the USB monitor. Okay, we're trying to fire it up with just that ThinkVision monitor. And we're getting a lot of angry beeping. So I've definitely now shorted something out and killed the board on this netbook. I knew I had another laptop around here somewhere with a bad screen. All right, well, this laptop kind of works. Um, it is significantly older than that netbook. I mean, this is from back when IBM was still a valid company. I think Lenovo bought them, and now Lenovo makes these ThinkVisions where it used to be ThinkPads. Um, yeah, this thing's so old, it has not only a serial port, but a parallel port. Yeah, it's not booting past this BIOS setup, and it's actually frozen there. I've tried getting out of that. All right, so I'm trying to use this broken Chromebook as the brains of the Cyberdeck, and it has no backlight, so the built-in screen is no good. Mm. I've got uh, my Lenovo brand ThinkVision monitor. This is also a Lenovo ThinkPad. That's a little Lenovo docking station. Unfortunately, they don't all quite work together very well. Um, the little docking station and the laptop need separate power supplies, which doesn't make this very portable. The uh, display port thing, that links through USB into the external display seems a little flaky. I also dug up this old Toshiba netbook with a cracked screen. Um, it has a few more physical features. It's got all the ports on it, whereas this Lenovo Chromebook has basically no ports. It has two USB ports, one of which is running this docking station. Um, this one, unfortunately, doesn't have the newest uh, USB 4 super speed blue flavored uh, ports, so it won't run DisplayPort, unfortunately. All right, so I've pretty much given up on this docking station thing. Um, I'm feeling like docking stations really died in the 90s, and Lenovo tried to bring them back, but they just didn't do a good job of it. So we're just going to go with a whole bunch of USB splitters. Since Bluetooth is being flaky on this thing, uh, we're using two USB ports for the monitor. One for the keyboard, one for the mouse. So we're back down to four USB ports on it. Now while the DisplayPort monitor does still kind of work through this USB splitter, it doesn't really like it. It wants two separate USB ports. It wants to take like 10 volts instead of just 5 volts. So anytime I try to turn up the brightness, it just times out, says insufficient power. All right, that's enough of this modern stuff. No more SSDs, no more Chrome OS, no more USB the blue one. We're going to go back in time on this project. So down here in the junk hoarding room, I mean the computer room, we have this whole pile of old all-in-one 
uh, cop car computers. I got these for a dollar. Yeah, literally one dollar for this entire pile of um, old Windows XP computers. Touch screen, um, they've got some ports on the back. Uh, they didn't have any power supplies, they didn't have any information to tell me if these worked. But, um, yeah, I bet we can get these up and running and throw some Linux on them. If we break it, well, heck, I got five more, and they only cost me a dollar for six, so I'm not going to lose any sleep out of toasting these. They couldn't tell me uh, exactly what the power supply is. We're assuming, since it went in a car, that's just 12 volts, so I'm going to give it my universal adapter here and just, uh, I just hook it to a car battery. It is new enough to have USB and uh, this newer display, and then um, they went with the world's smallest serial port. So, you know, they could have just done VGA out and a regular serial port, but they had to go with the special one and then whatever this is, which I will probably never find an adapter for, but we'll look around. Okay, so here's what's actually in one of those Datalux units. We've got a little hard drive down here, we've got our main board, memory, our touch screen, and looking closer, at that little jack that I thought was the power supply, that has some pretty small wires coming up to here. Bigger wires, red and black over here, going to this proprietary multi-pin connector. So maybe the power is supposed to come in through there, and this other one is some sort of auxiliary jack, audio jack output. We don't quite know. I did look this up online. This is one of these products that was probably only around for like two, three years in the mid-2000s. They sold a couple to some over-budgeted suburban police departments, and then they just disappeared. So there's really no documentation or much information online at all about it. Since I cannot find this cable online or anything like it, I'm just going to go ahead, cut the wires in here, and patch into them directly. All right, it's trying to boot. There doesn't seem to be an OS on this drive, so it's time to download a low-resource Linux distro. Wow, this one's too old for even that low-resource Linux Mint distribution I've been using. I finally found a version of Linux that seems to be installing. It doesn't need PAE, it doesn't need 64-bit, it'll work on this old 686 processor. Alright, now we get to see if the RTL SDR dongle is even going to work with this old OS and this old system. It looks like the RTL SDR with GQRX works, so that's the main thing that I wanted this system to do. And of course, just as I say that, our little 12 volt battery has run out of juice. So we're going to have to go recharge that. Uh, we'll take that opportunity to rearrange all this junk that I have piled up on the floor that's supposed to go into this case. Um, get the form factor figured out a little bit better, get the details worked out, get some of the equipment set up the way I want it, and we'll see where we go from there. So I've removed this original proprietary connector that was here, which I cannot find online, so this is useless. I've broken it out into its component parts. We've got 12 volt DC in, and we've got two USB ports. That doubles the amount of USB available to me on this platform, which I think we're going to need. I think we're going to use all the USB that we can on this thing for various purposes. So partway through this project, and this is kind of the concept mock-up of what this is supposed to look like. We've got our computer system. We've got our battery, uh, we've got some of our satellite controls, our little satellite meter interface, keyboard, extra equipment. I've broken out all the ports from the back of this computer into those external wires. I'd like to clean that up. I'd like to put in like a, like a plexiglass panel over there with some ports flush mounted on it. The computer in the top half of the case is going to be fairly standalone. This other stuff is going to be accessories or special purpose stuff that doesn't necessarily need the computer. In fact, I might go ahead and mount a lot of these other modules with just Velcro tape in here so they can be popped out, other stuff can go in. Some of this stuff in the bottom half is going to change. This battery is really too big. Uh, this controller, I don't really like it. I threw it together in a hurry back at one of my very first satellite videos, so I want to redo that. I think I want a different keyboard. I don't really like the feel of this. I might build like a flush plexiglass deck with some of these controls and ports built in. And then we need to find room for quite a bit of this stuff, especially the RTL SDR, some of the filters, the jumper wires, the other little ports and stuff. I'd like a lot of that to be built into the system. So even though this is the Save It For Parts channel, and I've been trying to use mostly old junk that I already have lying around, I did buy a couple new parts for this. I got a smaller and more convenient battery pack with a built-in charging system. And I got a smaller mechanical keyboard. And this actually fits in here just perfect, and it leaves room for the satellite meter off to the side. 
miscellaneous repair. The BIOS battery in this is dead, and it appears to be underneath the motherboard, which is really difficult to get to. You have to basically disassemble the entire thing to replace that BIOS battery. Just one of the many questionable design decisions that made Datalux a company no one's ever heard of. So I'd love to lose this giant, heavy, clunky metal case and just put the brain board somewhere in my cyber deck. But the entire clunky metal case is the heat sink for the processor. But now on the plus side, this thing does have some cool peripheral options. You've got the old PCMCIA card slot. You've got the uh, compact flash card slot because for about five minutes in the early 2000s, you could get wireless cards, you could get GPS cards in CF form, mostly for PDAs. Now, like I said, I've got just about every PCMCIA card ever made in here, including the peak of early 2000s Wi-Fi technology, the Orinoco Gold. Probably completely useless these days, but uh, this was the literal gold standard when it came to stealing Wi-Fi back in college. Anyway, I've got a couple of whatever these were called when these were... Uh, add-ons for laptops back in the day. This does seem to be a mini PCI port for a Wi-Fi card. This little Broadcom seems to be more common and has more Linux drivers, so I think we're going to go with this guy. Once it's in there, I'll probably never take it out again, just because it's such a hassle to get to this part of the motherboard. Of all the poor design decisions Datalux made, this particular ribbon cable is the worst. It's not long enough to go into its home without the lid being almost all the way shut, and it's incredibly fiddly to get into this little connector, so Basically, any time you open this, this flies out of the connector, is impossible to get back in. It requires about six hands to hold the lid at precisely the right angle, hold this little connector up, slip this into place, hold the flashlight to make sure it's going into place, get it closed down, and then get everything closed up again properly. So that Broadcom adapter pops right up, don't need to install anything extra. That's nice. I'm actually getting the codecs and audio stuff installed now. Uh, another issue I'm having is there seems to be a little bit of a fight between the touch screen on the tablet and my mouse. Uh, I keep losing uh, mouse clicking ability, so I need to get the drivers for that touch screen figured out or just disable it for now. And I'm definitely enjoying my little uh, light up RGB streamer keyboard here, made by Snipperdery, I think. I don't know how to pronounce that, but it's a fun little keyboard. Takes some getting used to not having the arrow keys and some of the function keys, but we've got a function button and then we can do pretty much anything else we want. So we've got our side panel here with the approximate layout of where I want all the ports mounted. So then I can take my preliminary layout, throw it into an image editor, make sure everything's aligned, make sure everything's the right size, give it a little extra text, and then I can print this whole thing out on a waterproof vinyl label. And that way I've got my drill alignment holes, I've got all my sizes correct, and I've got all my labels right on there. So I was hoping to attach my plastic piece here, putting these little mounting brackets underneath and using these little machine screws. I broke the tap, realizing these don't really fit. These are going to stick out at a weird angle. So All right, so we've got our mounting brackets, our nuts epoxied in place. Really hope that holds. Side panel in for a test fit. Perfect. You know, I was actually gonna get rid of this old light box because I never work with transparencies or slides, but you know what? The benefits of hoarding kick in once again, and I can actually pull this out for a project. Alright, I got a few more antenna connectors in to finish off this project, and yes, I am mildly amused by the name of these connectors. Alrighty, our CyberDeck project is essentially done with the finishing touches of new stickers on the case. I do have one or two minor things left, like touchscreen drivers, but this is essentially ready to fire up and do some satellite hacking. Now when I say hacking, of course I mean messing around with the satellite hardware here on the ground. 
I'm not doing anything illegal or unethical with actual satellites up in the sky. So let's open this up and see what we've got. As you can see, everything fits nicely in the case. I've got my side panel there. I've got storage compartments up here and down here for extras like antennas, cables, adapters, etc. And then all of my modules in here are Velcroed in place. So I can pull any of this stuff out, swap it around, replace it. I've got my satellite meter, I've got my battery pack. This ends up providing about an hour's worth of power, but I bought a couple of these so I can just swap them out when they die. Got our keyboard that can be used in place in the case or pulled out for greater convenience. And then we've got my other custom little panel here. So let me just walk through what I've done with these two. On the main panel, I've essentially broken out all of the ports from this COP computer, so they're all accessible right here on the front panel. The Ethernet, the USB, and then of course all the interfaces for my RF circuits. I've got my RTL SDR inside here, I've got a couple filters in here, and if I want to use the filters, I can just go ahead and put some jumpers on these ports. Then I can connect to my main antenna up here, and now we have the amplified saw filter plugged in between the antenna and the SDR. I also have a USB port up here, which I'm referring to as USB radio, so we can plug in things like Bluetooth adapters, or various little Wi-Fi adapters. We have an audio jack that goes into the main audio on here. And then we've got kind of our universal card reader with SD, micro SD, etc. Then to power the unit, we can take our cord from the battery down below and just plug it in right there to the panel and fire the thing up. So we actually have about three Wi-Fi options in here right now, only two of which really have drivers, and one of them's pretty old. Anyway, we've got the USB dongle, we've got our PCMCIA card, and then we've got our inboard um, mini PCI card which goes over to this antenna jack and then we're all set up for various radio experiments. Now while the drivers for this particular card do work I think it's only 802.11b so it doesn't actually work with my Wi-Fi but we could maybe throw it into bridge mode and use it as a local area network in the field. So next we've got my secondary panel down below here. We've got a USB hub we have the old uh, Kingdom control. I realized after I installed this I've actually traded away that particular dish but if and when I get another one of those, I can plug in a Kingdom dish, run the search, and then I can use a combination of these to do basic programming on that. I also have a breakout for my satellite meter over here, and a 12 volt DCN power injector for that, so if I don't want to use the satellite meter to power an LNB, I can do it through here. And then lastly, we have my PTZ controller, and I still have some old KU band dishes hooked up to that. So this is basically all the stuff that was in my old blue box before made sure to mark it so I don't accidentally hook up Ethernet to this because that would be extra spicy Ethernet. So we can do all the regular SDR stuff with this, like listen to some calming classical music on FM radio. However, this is really designed for space-related SDR radio stuff. So what kind of space stuff can we do with it? So now I can drive my big dish directly from my control system here. I can drive my little RV dish around while I look at the spectrum analyzer and see what it's seeing. So before we call it a night, I have one more thing to test. The old reliable NOAA weather satellites. We've got our V-dipole set up, we've got everything plumbed into the RTL-SDR, we're going to fire up GQRX, and we're going to see if we can hear and decode that weather satellite. And we're just waiting for the satellite to start passing overhead. Alright, we're definitely starting to see the data stream come through now. All right, well, so far I'm pretty darn happy with the Save for Parts Space Cyberdeck version 1. No, it's not quite the prettiest. Yes, there's still room for improvement, but it does everything I've tried so far. It works pretty well. It's a vast improvement over my suitcase full of junk, and I think it will go on to have many fine space-based adventures in future videos. For example, I've got this very cool thing over here that I traded a fellow for. We also have this whole stack of antique satellite-related stuff from Axeman. I have another interesting little device that's been loaned to me, and that might let me do something really cool like hook all of my stupid RV dishes together and make an array. But as usual, all of that is going to have to be additional videos. So definitely stay tuned for those, check out what we do with this thing in the future, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of that excitement, and we'll see you next time.